OK, great. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to be talking about a tool called the Checker Framework that can help prove your program correct or find bugs in it. So the reason we're all here is that your code sucks. And we're here because our code sucks, too. And we're all going to try to work through this together. I'm Michael Ernst. This Hi, is Werner Dietl. Um, so software fails are a huge problem. Uh, they cost over $300 billion a year. Uh, one particular bug cost over $300, $300 billion, just the Y2K problem. Um, but it doesn't, yeah, I don't have to wait a year to see the problems. The Knight Capital Group, which, by the way, doesn't exist anymore, lost half a billion dollars in 30 minutes due to a bug in their trading software. And both the US and European space agencies have also blown about that much money in just a few seconds, due, again, due to a software error. Now, these are the cheap failures. These are the ones that aren't that expensive, because they can also kill people. Uh, people have died in airplane crashes because of faults in radar, so radar software. Uh, the Patriot missile system targeted a, uh, an allied barracks. Uh, a blackout on the East Coast caused by a software fault caused at least 11 excess deaths. And cancer therapy machines uh, caused many deaths, at least eight. Software is now the cause for about 25% of all medical device re uh, recalls today. So we want to try to figure out how to prevent these. So we have a solution, uh, or at least a partial solution, that's called flexible type checking, and a tool called the Checker Framework that's open source. You can download and use it today. And we'll tell you a little bit about that. So the fundamental problem with Java's, so it's a tool for Java. The fundamental problem with Java's type system is that it's too weak. It, pre it prevents you from putting hello world into an int. But it doesn't prevent other types of errors. For instance, here's a piece of code at the bottom of this slide. Um, and it can actually fail with an exception. Do people know what? Yes. Uh, so it might fail with an IO exception. Uh, that's a good guess. This one doesn't actually fail in that way. So it may hang waiting for input. That's not a failure. That's just waiting for input. That's what it's supposed to do. But this can actually throw a null pointer exception. System.console can return null, for instance, if you're running on an embedded device or an essentially anything that's headless. The type system doesn't tell you this. The type system lets you compile and run your code fine, but then it fails at runtime. Here's another example. This will always fail every time will always crash. Do people know why? So, sorry? Yeah, it, it, uh, that's correct. Thanks. Um, it will give you an unsupported operation exception. Why? Empty list is unmodifiable. It doesn't support add. But the Java compiler doesn't know this. And so it lets you write this code, run it, and have it fail at runtime. Again, these are the cheap failures. These are the easy cases. The hard cases are ones that are silent. For instance, if you create a map and then side effect a key in that map, you'll corrupt the map. Who knows what will happen after that? Another error is a, uh, a SQL injection attack. So if you execute uh, some string that comes from a user, then you're in, you, they could uh, get access to all of your data or destroy it. And there's lots of other pro errors. I'm sure you've uh, seen them as well. So here's an, oh, yeah. okay. So here's an example of one particular type system. So the property that we want to enforce is that our program never sends unencrypted data over the network. Only encrypted data should be sent over the network. So we want to distinguish two different kinds of information encrypted information and unencrypted information. So here's a simple example um, where uh, we have an operation that takes some input string and sends that input string over the network. And then we have some user of that operation that uses, passes an unencrypted data as the input to this method. Does anyone see what's wrong with this operation, with this example? Does this um, hold up uh, the property that we want to enforce? Or is our property violated? Yeah. 
the property is violated in this example, but um, where is the defect in, in this code? Is the defect in the invocation of send to network or in the invocation of the operation? The thing is, without the specification, we cannot decide. Both of them could be the, the defect in the software because you don't have a specification. You don't know what is the intended behavior. If you use these annotations, you can make it explicit what the expected behavior is. So one specification is that the operation should always take an encrypted string as the input, and then this implementation of the operation is correct. You always take an encrypted string as input, and you can send an encrypted string to the network. But then the invocation of the operation is invalid because you pass something that's unencrypted to the supposedly encrypted uh, operation. The second possible um, specification is that the parameter is unencrypted. Then the invocation is valid, but the implementation of this method is not. You cannot just pass this unencrypted input string to the network because the network operation should only get encrypted strings. So by using these specifications, you can make explicit what the intended behavior of your application is. Instead of having only um, no knowledge about what the refined behavior is, you use these annotations to specify what the intended behavior is. So now the implementation of this method is incorrect. Now let's look at an example of how to do this. So could you switch us to the demo, please? So I want to show you a, a, an example of a demo about SQL injection. So this is some code that I, uh, it's called personal blog. I downloaded it from the internet, so it's probably and the, uh, this blog lets uh, people uh, make accounts and sign in, add uh, comments, search for comments. So uh, it's backed by a SQL database. And here is uh, a routine that executes a SQL query. So this is supposed to take as input an untainted string. If, uh, if it just used uh, data directly from the user, then you could have a SQL injection attack. So let's run something called the taintning checker that determines whether or not you really, um, uh, this program is really only passing untainted data to this execute routine, execute query routine. And the answer is, it's not. So here's an example. So it says it found a tainted string where it required an untainted string. And in particular, um, that's right here, category. So this is in a routine called get post by category. If you look at the rest of the program, this is really supposed to be untainted too. Everywhere that it's called, it's supposed to be, uh, an untainted value is supposed to be passed. So let's make that change and let's run the type checker again to see what happens. So there's still a problem. Here's a call to that routine. We just changed get posts by category. And again, we're passing in a variable called request category here. And the type checker says, although it requires an untainted string, that procedure is, is specified as taking an untainted string, request category is actually a tainted string. So uh, let's see where request category is defined is defined right here. So this get parameter takes data directly from the user query. And then it carefully ensures that it's not null, because that could cause a null pointer exception somewhere. And then it passes it straight uh, into a routine that eventually calls execute query. In other words, a malicious user could exploit this. What's missing is validation. In fact, everywhere in the entire program except this one line, proper validation is done. So I've just added a call to validate right here. And we can run the tainting checker a second time. And this time, it found no problems. So this is cool because it found a bug and we're able to fix the bug. But I think there's something even better about this. And that's that we have a guarantee that there are no more SQL injections anywhere in this program. That's the kind of proof that we want to be able to provide for programs. Go ahead. Can you switch back to the slides? Thank you. So now let's think a little bit about um, what these pluggable type systems are. 
So to express your security property or your property about the program and in a formalized way, and you put it into a type system. You formalize it as a type system. You annotate the application with this specification. So you make explicit what assumptions you have about the behavior of your program. And then as a third step, you use a, a pluggable type checker to enforce the correct usage of your application. So in our case, the pluggable type system is a plugin to the Java compiler and an annotation processor that you can run like any other annotation processor. The error output is um, standard Java error format messages, so it's very easy to integrate into other tools. Let's think about the workflow. In standard type checking, we make the Java compiler happy. Once the Java compiler is happy, we get the executable but we don't have all these additional guarantees that we would want from the executable. If the Java compiler gives us errors, we need to fix them. Without fixing the errors, we don't get the executable, and there are two kinds of fixes. Either it found a real problem and we fix that bug, or we just need to make the type checker happy. So sometimes we need to add additional Java types to make the type system happy. These additional optional or pluggable type checkers add a similar loop. We add an additional type checker that checks these enhanced properties. And there are two answers again. So we either get a warning from the optional type checker, and then either it found a real bug, or we need to make the type checker happy. So we need to add additional annotations to make the type checker happy. Once the optional type checker is happy, we actually have a guarantee about the behavior of the application. If there are no more warnings, the, the property that we want to enforce actually holds. The nice thing about this is that the executable gets um, generated as soon as the Java compiler is happy. You can perform manual testing or whatever, and then you run the optional type checker to get the additional security guarantees. Another nice thing is that you can run multiple optional type checkers. You decide what properties are interesting to you, and you enable only those type checks. So you can pick and choose what properties you want to enforce, whether SQL injection attacks are important to you, or whether you care more about null pointer exceptions. So you are free to choose. This tool, the so-called checker framework, is a plugin to the Java compiler that you run as an annotation processor. The nice thing here is that because it uses the standard Java compiler message format, it's very easy to integrate into um, all the different build tools. We provide an Eclipse plugin. It's easy to integrate in NetBeans and IntelliJ. Similarly, we provide instructions for how to run it from Maven, Gradle, and a few other build systems. And finally, we have a, a website from which you can run small snippets and just play around with the different type systems. So if you want to just get a feel about how this behaves, you go to this website and play around with examples for the different type systems. So you really can just make an experiment with the Mullinus checker and see how the annotations behave. So let's look at another example, this regular expression example. Um, can you switch to this laptop? So here we have a small um, application, a main program that takes two parameters we call pattern.compile, and then we match against the content string that we have. And then in the end, if we found a match, um, we output the first group. So who knows what might go wrong with this? Does anyone see any problems in this code? You don't know how many comment line arguments there are. That's one problem. Exactly. So you still see the pattern syntax exception. One problem is that the input that the user provides might not be a valid regular expression. There's a third kind of problem. So let's try. So here, the first parameter is the regular expression. I didn't find a way how to make this font bigger, unfortunately. So this is AB star star matching against the string ABC. If we run this, we get the pattern syntax exception. So now let's fix, um, fix the regular expression and make it AB dot star matched against ABC. 
Now we get an index out of bounds exception. So the problem is the regular expression matched against the string, but we didn't have any capturing groups in this string. And in this code, once the code, uh, once the regular expression matches, we just access capturing group one. <clears throat> but there's no guarantee that the regular expression contains a capturing group. So we have a type system that helps you enforce that all regular expressions that you try to compile are valid regular expressions, so that you never get this pattern syntax exception at runtime. And the second property that we enforce is that you always statically know how many capturing groups are in the string. So we do this, so let's show how the regular expression checker works. So we run this checker from Eclipse, and we get two warnings. The first one <coughs> is up here, complaining that the pattern.compile with a string where we statically don't know whether it's a regular expression. Excuse me. The second one down here, where the checker complains that we don't know whether there is at least one capturing group in that string. So the regular expression checker complained about both, um, both problems in the code, and you didn't have any false positives or any annotation effort. So how do we fix this problem? We fix this problem by adding a check to make sure that the string is actually a valid regular expression. <clears throat> so before we compile it, we make sure that the string is a valid regular expression. So we have a utility method that um, makes sure that the, the string is compiled, uh, is a valid regular expression, and if it's not, we output a user-friendly message. So if we run the checker again, the checker is now happy. So we don't get any warnings anymore, we make sure that the string is a regular expression and has at least one capturing group. And the nice thing here is that we don't need any explicit annotations in the source code. All the annotations are automatically inferred by the type system. Can we go back to the slides? <coughs> Sorry. So we've seen that t type systems are a great way to build a program analysis. They have a bunch of benefits. One is that they can find bugs. And we saw security bugs. We saw regular expression bugs. I think it's much more compelling that they can actually, it's a verification technology. So it's not just a bug finding technology. It can actually guarantee that your programs have no errors of particular types. It also improves the documentation. Sometimes you don't have to write any annotations. But when you do, that's telling the specification of your code, which is something that you and other programmers are going to need. And furthermore, it's machine checked. So you know it's correct. You know it's accurate. Um, it can also help uh, compilers and other tools, for instance, to make systems run faster. Now, those are the positives. Uh, every tool has its drawbacks as well. One negative is you have to write the types. Uh, you typically don't have to write too many. It's usually less than you write for Java generics. Um, and we have some type inference tools that will automatically determine these for you. And the other is that false positives are possible. The system might say, I can't prove this code is correct. Maybe it's correct for some really subtle, complicated reason. And in that case, you would need to suppress the warning. So another advantage of type systems is that they're really familiar to programmers. They run as part of their standard development environment. And programmers are used to it. They understand how type systems work. They're also modular, so you can type check uh, one procedure at a time, which makes them fast, and it makes them easy to interpret. Uh, people sometimes wonder, is this going to really clutter up my code? We've uh, run this on tens of millions of lines of code, and we found that for the worst is usually nullness. If you want to prevent null pointer errors, you have about one annotation per 75 lines. Uh, and we've seen much fewer with other type systems, like guaranteeing that interning, uh, your, that values are interned and quality checks are right. We saw 100 an annotations in 200,000 lines of code. And for uh, format strings, making sure the percent S's and percent D's are right, we saw 100 annotations in 3 million lines of code. They revealed 104 bugs. You can also just look at part of a program. 
So there, aren't, there are some false positives, as I mentioned, not too many. And first year computer science majors preferred using these to not using them. These are, uh, are being used at, here in Silicon Valley at big companies and at startups as well. They're being used at Wall, on Wall Street, lots of places that there are programmers who really care about their craft and want to get their code right. So here, um, we've sh uh, we shown you several type systems. The system actually ships with about 20 type systems. I'll go over some of them very quickly for you. One is for preventing null dereferences. And we actually have a talk tomorrow morning at 10.20 uh, in this room, actually. The, it's been moved. Um, and we found hundreds of errors in programs like, uh, like Google Collections and Java C. Another one for making sure that a quality tests are right. Again, hundreds of, uh, we found hundreds of errors in Apache code. Uh, for determining that you always hold a proper lock to prevent uh, race conditions, we found uh, over 500 errors, especially in server programs. Uh, sometimes programs use integers instead of enumerations, and uh, they can get those. How do you know you're using the right numbers? We have a type system that guarantees that. Um, you, you can also think about the values of strings. Often people jam information into strings. We saw that for regular expressions. Uh, I mentioned you can also uh, verify that printf format strings are correct, that they're consistent with all the arguments. Um, the JDK has uh, at least four different ways of representing a method signature, and sometimes people use the wrong ones. We actually found errors in OpenJDK and in ASM related to that. And we found errors in our own code. We built uh, something to make sure that the checker framework itself was using compiler message keys right. And we found eight errors, uh, eight bugs, that we had not known about until we ran this. We've also built a bunch of type systems for security. You saw one. Uh, we also have ones that, uh, for command injection vulnerabilities. For instance, when you use uh, user uh, user supplied data in a command line. We found five missing validations in Hadoop and uh, one for information flow privacy that detected malware in Android apps. So you probably just want to use ones that people have already provided. As I said, uh, it ships with 20. There are dozens more that other people have written uh, you can download. Um, you can also build your own if you want to be a type system designer. It turns out the checker framework makes that pretty easy to do. It's not that scary. I, I want to, um, to talk a little bit about the difference between verification and bug finding. So far, what we've talked to, uh, to you about is a verification tool. Uh, that's what the checker framework is. It's trying to give you a proof. That's quite different than bug finding tools and complementary to them. The goal of a verification uh, tool is to prove that there's no bug. The goal of a bug finding tool is to find a few bugs at low cost. In a verification tool, the user has to provide a specification. And you do that by writing those at signs, the, the type qualifiers. In a bug finding tool, the user doesn't have to provide anything. It guesses at what the program's supposed to do. In a verification tool, the goal is no false negatives. It's, if it says, I can't find any problems in the code, the code is right. There are no problems in it. In a bug finding tool, it's acceptable for it to say, I can't find any problems. Maybe there's some more. And a verification tool can have false positives, where it says, I can't prove this code is correct, but you can see there's some subtle or complicated reason for it. And bug finding tools have a lot of heuristics to focus on the most important bugs and avoid irritating users. So there are downsides. The downside of verification is that there's a user burden. The user has to write this specification. The downside of a bug finding tool is that it misses some bugs. It doesn't find everything. I, I really see these two approaches as complementary. Neither one is better than the other. Each one is appropriate in certain circumstances. You should choose which one is best for your situation and then use it. Maybe you'll use bug finding tools sometimes or in some parts of your code, and maybe you'll use verification in, in more important or central parts of your code. So the Checker framework is an open source project. Uh, its source code is available at this URL. We release every month. 75 people have contributed commits to the repository, and we close a couple of issues every week. Um, send, us, uh, send us an email, ask us questions, and we'd be happy to help you out. So the main takeaway that I want you to leave with is that pluggable type checking is a way to improve your code and to prove facts that you care about. Um, the checker framework is this tool that lets you create a type checker 
you probably want to use the ones that are already available, but you can make your own as well. And they have all the features of the Java language. They're effective. They're pretty easy to use, and they scale up to big projects. This allows you to prevent bugs at compile time rather than discovering them at runtime, or worse, having your customers or hackers discover them at runtime. So we encourage you to get started and improve your code. Uh, this is the URL. And we'll be talking uh, about one specific type checker and showing you a lot more examples of code tomorrow at 1020, again, in this room. So we've uh, left a few minutes for questions, and we'd be happy to take those. And thanks very much for your attention. There's a question here. Yeah. OK, so great question. The question was, um, Java has a number of defaults. So for instance, uh, by default, references are allowed to be null. But wouldn't it be better if they were non-null by default and you had to say something specific to make them allowed to be null? And likewise, variables and fields are allowed to be reassigned by default unless you write the final modifier. Wouldn't it be, uh, so the question is, could you reverse these defaults? Could you create a type checker that treats it the other way and gives you a warning if you haven't written nullable or haven't written reassignable? And the answer is yes. That's actually exactly what we've done for, uh, in, we'll, that we'll talk about tomorrow in the nullness checker. We've, we've made the default be non-null. It's safer, and it highlights, it's uh, more concise, and it highlights the really dangerous cases. And likewise, um, there are uh, checkers for immutability that you can download. We don't have one specifically about reassignability, but that's the sort of thing that could be added. Great question. Yes? Sorry? How, how do you type check code that's not owned by you? Mm-hmm. So we provide mechanisms Can for Can you how, repeat the question? Uh, so the question is, how do you provide annotations for third-party libraries for where you don't control the source code, you just have a jar file, and you want to use that jar file? How do you specify whether the method returns null or not? So we provide two mechanisms for you to specify that. One is a, a textual representation where you provide additional annotations for that jar file, and you simply specify what is the behavior of that third-party library. The other approach is we have a rewriting tool where you just rewrite that library and add the annotations. So that's a little bit more efficient because you don't need to pass that extra Java file. You just modify the Java file and have the annotations in there. So both of them allow you to specify annotations for third-party libraries. And the checker framework ships with annotations for some libraries, like parts of the JDK and a few others. Um, but you're right. If you want to verify your code, you have to know what the libraries it calls do. And we provide ways to do that. Yes? Uh, the talk tomorrow, is that mostly a uh, run through of using the checker framework as a uh, sort of compiling code with it, or is it about making new types of? The one tomorrow is specifically about the nullness checker. So it focuses on all the situations where you can get a null pointer exceptions in Java and walks through all the annotation mechanisms we provide to circumvent them, so to specify what your initialization behavior is and things like that. So it's more focused on the null pointer exceptions. On our website, you find tutorials for how to write your own type system. So if you're interested in how to make your own type system, we have tutorials online. Mm -hmm. So in the example, we had a, we have a, so the question is in the regular expression example, 
um, how did the checker framework know um, that this, um, can I give two format? That this is regex method has particular behavior. So in the checker framework, we have pre and post condition specifications where we specify what happens after a particular method call. And in this particular situation, we know that this regex util dot is regex method verifies that the first argument is a valid regular expression. And if that condition doesn't hold, we analyze the control flow to see that you exit the program execution. So we specify a post condition to, to this is regex method. If the input string is not a regular expression, we terminate the execution. So afterwards, we know if you're still executing that input string is definitely a regular expression and has at least one capturing group. So it's not, um, so in this case, in this case, I think it might be implemented in the checker. For other type systems, it's really SP and post condition specifications. One thing that's kind of cool about uh, every type system supported by the checker framework is that they're all flow sensitive. A variable is allowed to have different types on different lines of the program. After you do a test, you know more about the, the type. The type system should know more about the type too. So that's built into all of our checkers. And this was just one example of how that works. So that after, in, in the else clause, you know that it really is a regular expression. And so those, it's the same lines of code as before, but now it type checks. Or uh, the, the checker is now able to validate, to verify it. Good question. Maybe one last question. Are you aware of any, any other languages or projects with, this, with, with anything similar to the checker framework? Were, were you inspired by other work, or are you just uh, Greenfield kind of first? So I was inspired. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a programmer, and I'm an academic. Um, I like to build new type systems. But every time I build a type system, I also build a compiler because I want to run it on a million lines of code to see if it actually works, rather than just you know, writing a paper and, and proving a theorem. And so after doing this three or four times, I found it really tedious to write a new compiler every time. So I decided I would build a framework that makes it easy to build a new type system in a few hundred lines of code, even a research type system. Um, there are other research languages that uh, have capabilities like this, but none that are in any mainstream languages. So the theoretical concept is called refinement types. So if you look at refinement types, you find about a lot of papers about how to implement them on different language designs. Right. OK, well, thanks again. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you tomorrow. And we're around if you want to talk to us. Thanks. Mm -hmm.